All righty, so it looks like we have a good number of people here, so we'll get started. Welcome everybody, good morning. Thank you for joining us for this virtual event, Cataloging in the Time of COVID, a behind the scenes look at how the Huntington's American history materials are made accessible by archival processing. My name is Jackie Becky, and I'm a reader services librarian at the Huntington, and this event is part of an ongoing webinar series presented by the library's reader services department, the multi-storied library. I should mention that this presentation is being recorded and will be accessible via the Huntington Library website after this event has concluded. Today, we'll be taking a behind the scenes look at how a recent acquisition of American history materials, the Shapiro Collection, came to be in the Huntington's collections, how the foundational American collections have been accessed by researchers over time, and how all of these materials are being made more accessible through the art of archival processing, a crucial element of collections care and stewardship. Today, I'm joined by three fabulous panelists. Dr. Olga Sapina has been at the Huntington since 1998, before which she was a curator of the collections of Russian 18th century printed and manuscript materials at the Division of Rare Books and Manuscripts at Moscow University Library. She holds her PhD in history from the Moscow uh, Lamanasov University and her scholarly interests include comparative studies of religious enlightenment, the history of autograph manuscript collecting in the United States and correspondence networks in British America. Sapina's most recent ex exhibition at the Huntington was the US Constitution and the End of American Slavery. I'm also joined by Anne Blacksmith, who's the head of reader services at the Huntington, where she is responsible for the library's user-centered services. Prior to joining the Huntington, she was the head of digital services at the Getty Research Institute, where she acquired experience managing digitization projects. Anne holds an advanced degree in art history from the University of Bologna, Italy, and an MLIS from Drexel University. Melissa Haley is an American Presidential Papers Project Archivist at the Huntington Library. She has worked as a professional archivist for 20 years. Prior to the Huntington, Melissa held positions at UCLA Library Special Collections, the New York Public Library, the New York Historical Society, and elsewhere. She has a master's in US history and a certificate in archival management from New York University. We're going to leave time at the end of the talk for a Q&A session, which we'll be conducting in the Q&A box. Um, but without further ado, I'll turn this over to Olga. Yes, good morning, everyone, uh, or whatever time of day you are joining us in. Um, and th thank you so much for joining us for this uh, seminar. I'm very happy to, to, to be able to join you from the library. Actually, you could see from my background that I am on, the, on, on campus. Although it's hard to overcome the self shushing uh, impulse and abstain from lowering my voice when speaking in the reading room, which normally looks like this. And all these all the scholars who come to the Huntington from all over the world, and it's not just academics, but also educators, public historians, artists, and writers, and um, other, um, um, uh, other researchers are attracted by this impressive, uh, by superb Huntington's collections that have been, have been assembled from, for all over, almost um, over a century, uh, actually more than a century. We just celebrated our centennial. And among other collections, uh, the library holds impressive uh, 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 groups of papers of the United States presidents, vice presidents, congressmen, cab cabinet members, Supreme Court justices, and other federal officers. This includes, for example, the collections of Thomas uh, George Washington, including this superb map of Mount Vernon that Washington drew in December of 1793. A large collection of Thomas Jefferson papers, including this note, which is, seems particularly relevant today. This is uh, Jefferson's notes for uh, the 12th Amendment to the Constitution that established the Electoral College as we know it. Or the, uh, the large, a large collection of, the, of, of papers of Abraham Lincoln. And this is one of my most favorite pieces from the collection. That's his letters, a letter to Ulysses S. Grant, as Grant was uh, departing for what would become the decisive campaign of the Civil War in Virginia. The letter ends, and now with a brave army and a, and a just cause, may God sustain you. So why uh, all these? Um, why would all these treasures end up at a private California library? Uh, 
shouldn't they be all, or shouldn't be all these papers be in, in Washington DC or Mount Vernon or, or Monticello or Springfield? Until the Freedom of Information Act, presidential papers were regarded as private property. After the expiration of the term in, in, his, in office, the president would simply pack his papers and go home. He was also free to discard whatever he didn't want to keep uh, for whatever reason. That the papers of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, or Abraham Lincoln ended up at the Library of Congress was a result of sales or other private arrangements than, than, than that of policy. Uh, George Washington, at the end of his term in office, took his papers to Mount Vernon. He left uh, some files for, for his successor, Just Adam, uh, John Adams. The, the rest went uh, to, to, to Mount Vernon. He then uh, willed it to his, uh, to his nephew and his grandnephew, uh, who inherited the papers, sold it to the State Department uh, in two sales in 1833 and 18, in 1849. And in 1904, the papers were transferred to the Library of Congress. Jefferson likewise uh, willed his papers to, uh, to a descendant, his grandson, Thomas Jefferson Randolph. In 1848, Randolph offered to sell the archives to, to the United States and Congress authorized the, the purchase on August 12, 1848. Lincoln's papers were inherited by his eldest son, Robert Todd Lincoln, who did it into the Library of Congress in 1823, however, the papers remained sealed until 1947 because of a codicil that stipulated that the papers remained closed until 20 years after the younger Lincoln's death. Uh, before they ended up at the Library of Congress, the integrity of all these masses of papers suffered quite a bit. For example, uh, Bushrod Washington, uh, Washington's nephew, the first owner of the paper, papers, was in a habit of giving away letters, away as souvenirs to his friends, political allies, business associates, and so on and so forth. Uh, we actually have quite a few of those things that somehow that's, that, that was one of the Bushrod Washington's um, um, habit. Jefferson papers were split several times. The State Department, uh, when, when the State Department received the collection in 1848, uh, the librarian chose to retain only the public papers. The private uh, letters were returned to the family. The family offered it to sell them again in 1888, but after four years of negotiations, Congress, in its typical ways, uh, failed to garner the votes uh, necessary to authorize the purchase. So the collection remained in the family. And in 1898, sorry, Thomas Jefferson Coolidge, Jefferson's great grandson, donated them to the, to the, to, to the Massachusetts Historical Society. However, other, uh, other groups of the private Jefferson papers ended up in the possession of other descendants. A large group of Jefferson materials, including his architectural drawings, ended up in the possession of his great granddaughter, uh, a lady named Cornelia Jefferson Taylor. And in addition to these archives accumulated by the presidents, there were numerous letters retained by other people. For example, this is another far fine example from, from our George Washington collection. This letter from George Washington to Joseph Whipple in which the president of the United States demands that the collector of the port of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, a federal officer delivered to him his wife's runaway slave woman, enslaved woman on a judge was preserved in the collection of Whipple's brother-in-law, Keith Spence, um, which came to the Huntington in the 1960s. Here he is, Joseph Whipple. Uh, and innumerable, innumerable letters by Abraham Lincoln were retained by friends, associates, office seekers, and a relatively new genus of collectors, autograph seekers, all as they were known in the 19th century literary mosquitoes who played celebrities and um, stooped. Uh, there was nothing low that they could stoop to, to, to collect a, an autograph of a celebrity. And as a result, thousands of presidential letters ended up in, in an open marketplace. And the, the uh, collectors were legion. Manuscript collecting that originally the domain of well-heeled gentlemen, so uh, so-called antiquaries, democratized in the 19th century. There were lawyers, physicians, teachers, businessmen, officers, and other amateur collectors who pursued the autographs of the signers of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and other American notables. And in the early 1900s, when the notion of the founding fathers made its first appearance, 
uh, the first time uh, this expression um, appears in the uh, speech by Warren G. Harding in 1916 at the Republican National Convention. Autographs of this rather nebulously defined group uh, became especially desirable. Serious collecting, however, remained the domain of the wealthy, including our founder, Henry Edwards Huntington, uh, who was one of the leading uh, collectors of, of, of his day. His purchases lay the foundation of the library's collections of presidential papers. For example, in 1918, he purchased a, a massive collection of Americana from William K. Bixby, a Missouri uh, railroad tycoon uh, who collected rare books and manuscripts, including uh, Big, the Bixby collection included that uh, chunk of uh, Jefferson private papers uh, that he acquired from Mrs. Taylor, uh, Jefferson's grand, granddaughter. In one of his um, first acquisitions, Mr. Huntington's, that is not Mr. Bixby's, was the papers of this gentleman, Will, uh, Ward L. Lamon. I, that was Lincoln's old law partner. And uh, during the Civil War, he served as the Marshal of the District of Columbia, uh, the first man to, to actually to occupy this, this position. Uh, he also was um, Lincoln's self-appointed bodyguard. Lamon retained a massive amount of Lincoln letters, uh, including the last thing that the president wrote, ever wrote to him. This is a pass that allowed the bearer W.H. Lamon and friend with, um, uh, with, 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 ba with baggage to pass from Washington to Richmond and return. Uh, the friend would be John P. Usher, the Secretary of the Interior. The men were headed to Richmond to negotiate the terms of the surrender of the Confederate States of America. Uh, and you notice that the, as the letter is dated April 11, 1865, three days before the assassination. Lamon was not there uh, when Lincoln was shot. And he could never forgive himself for, for this. And this, this, uh, this piece is known as Lincoln's death warrant. Mr. Huntington wouldn't say no to a single letter or a manuscript offered by an auction house or a private sale, but he favored something they called unblock uh, purchases of entire collections, libraries, or or archives. And this is why the Huntington came to be known as the Library of Libraries. The arrival of, of the Dennis Shapiro collection, a superb collection of presidential autographs donated to us by Dennis Shapiro in la last year, marks a new landmark in the history of, of the Huntington collection, collections. The library treats each collection as an organic body that cannot be dispersed uh, or dismembered for whatever reason. And this of course means that because the library uh, contains numerous libraries, the collections are extremely complex. You know that any collection of family or personal papers is actually unique and idiosyncratic in itself because different people retain different things for whatever different reasons. But the co content of each collection, can, can, uh, the content of each collection cannot be easily surmised. For example, um, an archive of a real estate developer in Chicago in the um, late 19, uh, 1890s may contain a Lincoln letter that he'd received as a gift from a business associate. These quirks and idiosyncrasies are multiplied hundredfold in a library like the Huntington, which it takes concerted effort by curators, librarians, and catalogers to make sense of this incredible complexity. Basically, basically what we're dealing here is about, I don't know, 100 jigsaw puzzles whose content was dumped, or dumped on the table and we need to put it back together the ultimate Humpty Dumpty experience. Uh, and the, the, it is important to make sense of this incredibly, incredible complexity because we need to make this important public re records discoverable. Fortunately, the Huntington is lucky to have the best librarians, reader services specialists, and catalogers in the business. This job may lack the glamour of heroics, it's kind of pedestrian, um, but it's incredibly labor intensive, difficult and challenging under the normal circumstances. And as we all are too aware, there is nothing normal in the situation that we find ourselves in the moment. Um, so I, I will, will, will hear from the people who actually do this incredibly important work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. 
Uh, my name is Ann Blacksmith. I'm the head of reader services at the Huntington. And I am delighted to be here this morning with Jackie, Olga, and Melissa uh, to time travel through the various resources that were available and are available to researchers who are studying American manuscripts at the Huntington. My presentation today is a historical flash summary of the efforts of Huntington staff, past and present, as well as milestones in the wider archives and library profession to enhance access for researchers. The Huntington's 1929 annual report announced Professor George Sherburn, who was also a librarian at the University of Chicago as an incoming fellow who would research and write a history and descriptive summary of the library's collections. Written in collaboration with library staff, Sherburn's article, Huntington Library Collections, a resume of the library's foundational collections appeared in the inaugural issue of the Huntington Library Bulletin. The third issue of the bulletin was entirely dedicated to American collections and featured articles on the Loudoun and Lieber collections, as well as the letters of Andrew Jackson. As early as 1929, researchers could access the library's card catalogs. While most books were cataloged by the early 1930s, the cataloging of the manuscripts collection was a much larger complicated endeavor. So large, in fact, that Henry Huntington authorized the construction of a new North Wing to make space for manuscripts processing. The manuscripts card catalog has two main series, are alphabetical by author, addressee, and chronological. Although it closed in 1994, it still serves as an important point of access today. To supplement the card catalogs and the articles in the bulletin, the manuscripts department began publishing summary reports or narrative overviews of the collections. The first summary report appeared in the fifth issue of the bulletin for the Hastings manuscripts. In, 1940, in the 1940s, some summary reports of the, of the manuscript collections were collected into a series of publications called Huntington Library Lists. In 1941, uh, reports of the American manuscripts collections from the 16th to 18th centuries were collected into a single volume, Huntington Library List number five. The Huntington's manuscripts collections were also included in the first National Union catalog of manuscript collections in 1962, known as Nukmut. Modeled on the National Union catalog, the first volume describes 7,300 collections in 309 repositories. Each entry included an item count, mode of access, and as you can see for this, the Ulysses Simpson grant collection, uh, that the point of access is catalog cards in the library, and some provenance information. In 1975, the Huntington was awarded a grant from the National Endowment of the Humanities to produce the Guide to American Historical Manuscripts, affectionately known in-house as the Blue Guide. This guide was designed to familiarize scholars with the scope of the collections and included, collection, included collections arranged in catalog before 1975. It was more comprehensive than previous publications and less selective, covering the 16th through the 20th centuries. Reader guides created by the Reader Services Department provided detailed instructions for navigating the manuscript card catalogs. This guide from the 1970s illustrates the types of cards a researcher would encounter while using the catalog. It also gave information on how to request materials for use in the reading room. 
19, in the 1985, the 1985, 1986 Huntington Annual Reports announced that the computer had entered the library and things will never be the same. The library had plugged into Arlen, the research library's information network, and its holdings were discoverable for the first time online. In 1996, the Huntington launched its website and the library had a large presence. It published a series of research guide pages, including one for American history. Their website obviously also gave information uh, as to how to contact the library and using the library. Our online catalog debuted in 2002. So here's a picture of the catalog today posing with uh, uh, its baby picture <laughs> from 2002 and as part um, of the retrospective conversion project formally launched in 1997 with the printed materials card catalog, the library received an additional grant to create online records for manuscript collections, a project Olga was a part of when she arrived at the Huntington. This is my last slide, which gives a preview of what Melissa will be talking about. Uh, in 2021, the Huntington has over a thousand finding aids in the online archive of California, making our manuscript collections even more accessible to researchers. So now I will uh, transition to the star of our show, Melissa Haley. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with archives and archival labor, but for those who aren't, I thought I'd provide a brief overview here. Basically, archives assess, collect, organize, preserve, and provide access to records of enduring value. These efforts occur in a variety of settings, such as government archives, special collections libraries like the Huntington, universities, historical societies, institutional and corporate archives, and so on. We archivists here at the Huntington are a crucial part of the library team that makes all of these activities happen. Archival records are found in a myriad of formats. We have letters, diaries, notebooks, photographs, financial, medical, and legal records, moving images, sound recordings, and nowadays, of course, many of these are born digital material. Processing is an important component of archival labor. It involves what we refer to as arranging and describing which basically means organizing material, both intellectually and physically. The intellectual arrangement of a collection generally follows the basic archival principle of original order. This involves creating a meaningful organic order for the collection that reflects how the creator of the materials organized or used them. With complex collections, arrangement usually involves the creation of multiple groupings of material or series. And the amount of material, the amount of detail in arranging and describing depends on several factors, including the rarity and condition of materials, their value, expected use, and other considerations. Archivists create intellectual access to material with finding aids and catalog records. These resources aim to provide enough information for researchers to find and identify materials of interest. And I'll provide a little more detail on those momentarily. We also usually perform basic preservation tasks while processing, including rehousing material into acid-free archival containers and assess conservation needs, all of which help ensure the materials will stay in good enough shape for future use. So as I just mentioned, one of the archivist's many tasks is creating finding aids for collections. A finding aid is a document that places the material in context by consolidating information about the collection such as its acquisition or provenance, which is where the collection came from, and the biographical or administrative history of the persons or organizations that created the collection. You'll also see information about the scope of the collection, including its size, subjects, and types of media, and about the collection's organization and arrangement. Finding aids also usually include an inventory of the series and boxes with box and folder numbers listed. These container lists, as we call them, are important for managing archival collections, especially large complex ones. They help the researcher to know what to page and help our staff find and deliver the right materials. 
A primary goal of archivists is to post searchable finding aids online so that collections are discoverable to researchers. And as Anne mentioned earlier, the Huntington uses the Online Archive of California or the OAC to host its finding aids. Another way to provide intellectual access to archival material is to create a catalog record that outlines basic information about the collection and is similar to what you'd see in a finding aids overview and has searchable subject headings. Catalog records are generally shorter and link out to finding aids for more details. On occasion, we also create catalog records for single items if it's not part of a larger collection or if warranted by that individual item's importance or value. So a little bit about my project. The American Presidential Papers Project is a three-year project dedicated primarily to the Huntington Library's archival material for US presidents from George Washington to Woodrow Wilson. I'm creating finding aids and catalog records that will enhance the online access to information about our holdings. And there will also be research guides that will assist readers in locating presidential material. I'm using item level description for this project, which is generally atypical of our goal description, but is justified in this case due to the rarity and importance of the material. This project covers several discrete collections and hundreds of individual items in the library's manuscript file. The amount of material for each president varies greatly. Some of the largest collections we have are for George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Ulysses S. Grant. This project also includes the processing of the recently acquired L. Dennis Shapiro collection that Olga mentioned earlier, which contains over 450 items of original material from US presidents Washington to Obama. And this is one instance where I will be going beyond Woodrow Wilson. With a large number of items from the Adamses, both John and John Quincy, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and Warren G. Harding. The collection also has material from Albert Gallatin, who was Secretary of the Treasury under Jefferson and Madison, other cabinet members, Supreme Court justices, several presidential spouses, including Abigail Adams, Dolly Madison, and Eleanor Roosevelt, and a small amount of material relating to famous explorers and British politicians and royalty. So my first day of work on this project was February 18th, um, 2020, which was fittingly the day after President's Day. But as we know, I was not at my desk for long. My last day of work on site before stay at home orders was March 16th, which was the date still displayed on my women scientists perpetual calendar upon returning to my cubicle on August 12th to work a part time socially distant staggered schedule. Luckily, the four weeks I'd spent on site at the Huntington at the beginning of the project were enough to give me some ideas about what sort of work I could do from home that would help to move my project forward. Obviously, I could not take the original presidential letters and documents home with me, but one thing I was able to take advantage of while telecommuting was the abundant legacy metadata that exists for the Huntington Library's presidential material, especially in the manuscript card catalogs that Anne mentioned earlier. These catalogs are no longer updated, but were retained, and they contain item level information, even for the larger collections like Washington, Jefferson, and Grant, each of which has hundreds of items. While working from home, I entered the information from these individual catalog cards into Excel spreadsheets, which will eventually be uploaded to our collection management system, which is called ArchivesSpace, and be transformed into container lists for various presidential finding aids. Ultimately, metadata was captured for almost 2,000 items in discrete collections. And this is the spreadsheet for the George Washington collection, which has almost 600 item level entries. I'd already completed a preliminary spreadsheet for this collection's container list prior to stay at home orders, which I was able to revise and build upon using published sources while telecommuting. I also use the manuscript catalog cards to create drafts of online catalog records for individual presidential items that are not in discrete collections. Usually you would have the items on hand for description purposes while cataloging, but at least I could create a skeleton draft of a record using legacy metadata to build upon once I was able to access the material again. I completed drafts of catalog records for 335 individual items while working from home. I was also able to work on the Shapiro collection while telecommuting. 
I used accession databases to create an initial spreadsheet for the collections container list and happily digital surrogates for most of the items were also available. So I could actually read the material at home, enhance description and test my skills at deciphering handwriting. So the items in this slide include a letter from Abigail Adams written in 1785 while the Adamses were in Paris, which discusses French weather, customs, theater and contemporary fashion and some notes from Francis Perkins, who was FDR's Secretary of Labor and is known as the architect of social security. And these are notes that were written by her after she, uh, a discussion that she had with him about that very topic. This slide illustrates the transformation of metadata from manuscript catalog card to finding aid. You can see the progression from catalog card to item level spreadsheet to archive space container list to the searchable finding aid on the online archive of California. Again, much of this, uh, the work involved for this process could be done while telecommuting for this particular project because so much legacy metadata already existed. And this is the finding aid for the George Washington collection, which is currently under review and should be posted to the OAC soon. And as I mentioned, I've been back working at the Huntington um, since August on a part-time basis. During this period, I've spent the bulk of my time on site rehousing material from the Washington and the Shapiro collections into new acid free archival folders and boxes. Ultimately, I've rehoused and labeled folders for over a thousand items. So, to wrap up, uh, this first year of the American Presidential Papers Project has obviously been a challenging one. But, like everyone here at the Huntington Library, I was able to pivot quickly rethink my plan of action, and with the input and assistance of many of my new colleagues, move the project forward under these difficult circumstances. So stay tuned for more presidential finding aids and catalog records in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, for that great overview, and to Anne and Olga for that wonderful presentation. Before we move into the Q&A portion of the talk, I am going to go ahead and drop a uh, link to a feedback form in the chat box. So we would appreciate your, your feedback. Uh, so feel free to, to complete that in your own time and after this presentation is completed. But, um, let's move into the Q&A portion of the talk now and I'll just uh, read some of the questions I see coming in. For those of you who have questions and haven't submitted them, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to put your questions in there. So I have somebody asking uh, Melissa a bit about your spreadsheet. She's asking about the titles of your columns, how you're structuring your spreadsheet, and do you use the term records? Um, that spreadsheet is a template uh, that was created, I think by somebody at Harvard. So the, the terms, uh, were already created for us. Um, and then they map onto the same uh, uh, terms that are used in archive space. So when you upload it, 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 all the data matches to all of the labels that we use in archive space that, that you'll see in the finding aid once it's published online. And I, I do use the term records. Uh, I usually use those for like organ organizational records um, in contrast to say personal papers, I would use papers for more personal collections. The next question would be your presidential papers finding aids seems like a throwback to the indices of the Huntington use pre-internet. Wouldn't keyword searching catch all the individual items spread throughout the collections? Um, yes, well, you, you will be able to do keyword searching within the finding aids. Um, and also our our finding is are usually discoverable by Google. Uh, so for example, if you even if you just use a simple Google search uh, for a particular letter, a reference to our finding it to OEC finding it or the or cataloging record um, usually comes up. Terrific. The next question from our audience. How many people work in the manuscripts department at the Huntington? We have a curatorial department uh, and overall right now there are 16 people. Um, curators and librarians uh, who tackle different uh, curatorial bailiwicks. Mine, for example, is, as you probably guessed, American history, um, but uh, I'm geographically constrained uh, because it's only from uh, the um, uh, east of the Mississippi. My colleagues 
handle the Western um, United States and California and Hispanic materials, uh, literary manuscripts, uh, British manuscripts, ephemera, um, uh, architectural drawings, and photographs. So. Terrific. My next question, are any portions of the Huntington's collection available for public inspection? And how is access requested? Um, okay, I'll, I'll hold the conversation. Um, <coughs> we actually, the, yeah, the, the, well, the short answer is yes. Uh, the Huntington has a, something called HDL, the Huntington Digital Library. Um, it's, um, if, if you saw, if you notice, there are some um, um, images attached to the cataloging records. You click on the link and it takes you to the HDL. So at this point, uh, we're still populating it. But for example, the entire collection of our orderly books of the American Revolution has been cataloged, uh, has been digitized and uploaded. And you don't have to request anything. You could just go on HDL and, and, uh, and look at this. Or uh, the manuscript of Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, which we hold, is also available um, for free at, the, um, at, at HDL. Uh, and another large collection that we're very proud of is a collection of the United States Military Telegraph, which contains quite a few of Lincoln telegrams. These are ledgers that were accumulated by <clears throat> a USMT head, and we acquired them. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I swear it's not COVID, it's just dry throat. Um, and we acquired them in 2012. So all of these are has been digitized, uploaded, and is available. If you have a specific document in mind, um, I'll let Anne answer this question because it, which is not digitized. That Anne will be in, uh, it will uh, tackle this one. <laughs> Uh, re all researchers are welcome to contact us at reference, uh, reference at huntington.org. That's our email address. You can also contact us from the homepage of the library catalog and other places on the Huntington website. Um, at the moment, access to the library were closed like many places due to uh, county health order. And um, we will be uh, letting people know when we're ready to reopen when that time comes. So hopefully it comes sooner than later. In the interim, any researchers are welcome to contact us through reference and we're happy to assist you. And the Huntington the Digital Library is still be populated, so watch the space. Yeah, I put a link. I put a link to the digital library in the chat. Um, my apologies for my internet going out for a moment and dipping out. Um, I will continue reading some questions here. Uh, it says here, um, can you recommend any digitizing services for a family collection of historical materials? Um, well, that's, that's, that's the problem with, again, with the library like the Huntington. We do, we, we do um, because we, we're basically a collection of private libraries and we do have quite a bit, um, uh, quite a bit of material for family historians and genealogy uh, researchers and um, people who study the heritage. Unfortunately, because of the idiosyncratic nature of the collection, um, it's a little hard to put together a comprehensive unified guide to genealogical resources uh, for obvious reasons, uh, because it's just incredibly labor intensive and difficult. <coughs> and again, they're not easily surmisable. We are not a, an archive technically, we're an assemblage of private libraries. So the best course of action would be to contact us and ask us if we have anything on a particular person and we'll be happy to look, uh, look them up. That's that's at this point. It's just in, in the in the in the future, which I hope is not is foreseeable. We probably will have quite a, a lot lar larger digital collections. But given the current circumstances, we can't really promise anything, since we simply don't know. I'm going to keep uh, reading these questions as we have a lot coming in. Um, somebody asked, is there a specific manual that you use for archival processing, or is it the Huntington's own system? Uh, we use the Society, uh, mainly we use the Society of American Archivists manual series. Um, they have several volumes and the one that uh, pertains to processing is called Arranging and Describing. So it's the Society of American Archivists. And I see an, a couple of other questions here. Uh, people are asking who processes the Hispanic materials? Um, 
Melissa, maybe you want to talk a bit about your team and how there's more of you at the Huntington and you process many types of materials. Um, sure. Yeah, I don't think there's a designated uh, archivist for the Hispanic uh, materials, uh, but we have several team members who process collections from all the different curators. Uh, we do have a designated curator, uh, Dr. Clay Stoltz, who curates Hispanic materials, and uh, his contact information is available on our website uh, if, you, if, you, if you wish to contact him. Um, and somebody is also asking, are any of the project items going to be on exhibit anytime soon? <laughs> well, um, not in the brick and mortar exhibit because we're not allowed to um, host exhibits at this point, uh, again, for obvious reasons. Um, we have, yes, we, we, for, uh, we actually we use a lot of our, um, our um, uh, collections in exhibits. For example, the latest exhibit, What Now?, which uh, documents the history of, uh, recent history of, the, of Huntington's, the Huntington Library is collecting, um, opened just, uh, was installed just before the current unpleasantness started. Um, and the second installment is due to go on as soon as we are allowed to. Uh, but we also, um, um, we, we don't really have at this point, we have a, a, an occasional exhibit of a single, it, it's more of a, it's not an exhibit, but we're planning exhibits online. Uh, but for example, we do have something called Versa, which is our blog, um, our blog. And there are individual uh, items highlighted with basically amounts to a, an exhibit of a single item. So yeah, I highly recommend you check it out. It's actually it's a wonderful resource. Um, but for example, my exhibit in the, the United States Constitution and American slavery was entirely archival materials. So I'll go ahead and read the next question uh, from one of our attendees. Uh, what are the obvious reasons for not posting exhibits? Oh, the COVID-19. We simply can't host, we're, we're, all indoor spaces are closed. Uh, we can't host um, anything in the galleries. Uh, the Huntington uh, gardens are open because it's open, open air, but we can't really host anything indoors, including exhibits. Thank you. Okay, next question from overseas. Are there online archives for other states, please? E.g., I have researched the Lieber collection and letters to Lieber are in the collection, but replies are in the recipient's collection at Harvard. I would like to trace those now. Well, <laughs> um, the uh, again, this is kind of a again because we're a private institution, we're not a state library. We do have contacts with our colleagues, um, and the best of co course of action would be just to check uh, the um, uh, collections of um, depositories that that do have papers of, say, Francis Lieber. Um, the uh, also another another repository is New York, New York Public Library because uh, part of the Lieber papers that ended up at the Huntington, oh, there was a there was a part of a collection that was acquired by uh, NYPL. So at this point, I'm afraid there is no shortcut really. Uh, you just um, you, you you have to check the catalogs of the of, of the repositories that have uh, Lieber papers. The only shortcut is WorldCat. Um, it's WorldCat.org which allows you to pull together um, a list of repositories that would contain Lieber papers, uh, including even, even individual, individual items, and then um, contact the respective institution. There's also a searchable resource called Archive Grid, Archive Grid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. similar to OCLC. I think Archive Grid was incorporated in WorldCat, wasn't it? Maybe I'm mistaken. Here, I'll... Right, but be between the Archive Grid and WorldCat, uh, you should have a pretty good coverage. I'll put a link to Archive Grid in the chat. Mm -hmm. I was going to do that. Somebody's asking about related transcription and crowdsourcing projects, and we don't have any of those happening right now at the Huntington, but that's an excellent question. And I know that there are projects out there related to American history. If you're interested in learning more and potentially seeing if there's projects you can get involved with, I would say email the library reference at huntington.org and I would be happy to follow up with you and pose some ideas and do a bit of digging. So feel free to reach out to us. Um, let's see here, reading through some more questions. So somebody's asking, um, 
as Melissa may not be able to access all of the original materials and has pivoted to using historic metadata for a portion of the finding aids, you first see going back uh, to review the finding aid at a later time. Melissa, do you want to answer how complete of a job you can do from home or, or, or fill people in on your process for publishing the finding aid once you've had ample time to on site and all of that? Sure, yes, all of, all of the work that I've done at home that I described uh, will be double checked uh, once I'm back, I, mean, I am back on site part-time right now. So I've been doing a bit of that with the Washington collection. Um, but I will be going back to the original materials on site to make sure all of that information is accurate before I uh, post the finding aids. Somebody is also asking, what are the challenges you usually face when maintaining a digitized collection? And do you want to take that one on since you're familiar can, with digital libraries? Can you repeat the question? Um, let's see here. Uh, sorry, I have to pull it up again. What are the challenges you usually face when maintaining a digitized collection? When maintaining a digitized collection? Um, let me see. So like a born digital collection or in the digital library? If it's in the digital library, I guess um, there's there's lots of challenges to digitization, but uh, overall uh, digitization projects rely on, let's say, uh, the metadata work that uh, Melissa and archivists do to give the, the um, to give the digital project uh, context and structure. Context would also come from subject specialists like uh, curators, for example, Olga's expertise would also help shape a digital project. Then you have to think about um, usability. Uh, do the ingest, uh, let's say, um, do the ingest satisfy sort of user requirements that, res that researchers might have in locating the material. So um, digitization is never perfect. It's always a compromise solution. Uh, but um, I, I hope that helps answer, answer your question. There's various levels of control that digitization like archival processing as well. Uh, it's also labor intensive because you can't yeah. just flip the pages. Uh, there is a procedure, especially if you deal with fragile materials, um, say with separation of the fold or folds or letterpress books, is we have to be handled really carefully, which of course creates a different timeline. It takes twice as long, if not uh, thrice or four times as long as just digitizing a book. So. Um. Somebody is also asking here, are there any areas that are current priorities for the Huntington to accession new materials or collections? Um, well, I'll, I'll start and then maybe uh, Anne will. Um, for, for, Amer for, the, for the American historical collection, uh, we're, we're the two, 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 two approaches. One is building on the existing foundations. For example, our particular strengths are the Seven Years' War, the American Revolution, the Civil War. So we keep acquiring uh, collections that uh, uh, materials that fit into these um, uh, these uh, strengths. For example, uh, two years ago we acquired a collection of letter of James Mercer, who was killed. Uh, during the siege of the um, Fort of Oswego in 17, 1756, uh, during the Seven Years' War, and they fit right in. I was just almost per it was perfect fit to to our collections. But we also um, pursuing a new um, different um, directions. For example, in the 1920s, the collection collecting was kind of celebrity oriented. Uh, people were interested in the uh, materials by the great men. And of course, nobody collected enslaved people, the people of color, or people who lack uh, the status of, of the great uh, of, of greatness. So this is something that we are particularly interested in. And one of our, our most recent acquisitions, and um, it's, it's it's very exciting. We acquired um, a uh, an extremely rare manuscript, uh, the uh, a journal uh, kept by an operator of the Underground Railroad. 
the, these, these records are exceedingly rare because the underground railroad operators and conductors were basically breaking the law, so they didn't care, care, care to keep records for this. Uh, the account book of Z um, Zachariah Sugar has been digitized, by the way, and available in our HD, uh, HDL, so feel free to take a look at it. Um, we also acquired recently an, an archive of a salt works in West Virginia that ran entirely on enslaved labor. Uh, so this is this is very exciting. Um, and but I, I could only speak for myself because again there are a lot of um, other collecting areas and each of us have our own collecting priorities. But be, uh, generally we try to collect um materials of people who've been long on um, um you know ignored underrepresented or forgotten uh for whatever reason um so that's uh, i hope that answers the question again i, I could talk for hours because <laughs> but it's it's a very it's it's it's, it's a wonderful question but it's it, it and it's it's very um um but again i could tell stories for for hours and hours and hours so i'll just end right here <laughs> Well, I'll ask one more question from the audience okay. here. When in California, I always check your great exhibits. Are you planning to create digital exhibits even later on to complement in-person exhibits? I guess it's mine too. <laughs> well, I, yeah, it's, it's. I guess this is sort of a curatorial question. Um, well, the short answer is yes. Okay. We are working on that. Uh, at this point, we'll have to find uh, it, it's more of a, it, it's kind of a combination of a technical uh, pl uh, problem and the content because we have to find a platform that would work for us, be uh, best for us, um, and develop a plan. Um, right now, everything is sort of in, in su suspended state. So, uh, but we will, we, we are planning on, on developing and hosting um, online exhibits. All right, well, I think we're close to the hour, so we'll wrap it up there. And for those of you who did pose a question that we didn't get to, I will um, get you our questions after the fact, and we'll be able to reach out to you via our reference email account at The Huntington. I did put a, a link to our feedback form in the chat. We would love to hear your feedback about this program. And thank you again so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your attendance. And with that, I will sign off here. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending.